Okay, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Mike Creeden. Um, I'm the technical director at Inselectro. And again, I'd like to welcome you to Altium's uh, Team Train. And this is a uh, live um, YouTube uh, production coming to you. And uh, essentially, I believe I have to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because we've got uh, people watching this uh, across the United States and into Europe. So again, welcome. I'm all glad you're here. Um, we're going to spend the next two hours uh, covering a, a significant amount of slides and uh, with explanation. And so by way of housekeeping, I encourage you to follow along, take notes as you're going. And if you encounter any questions along the way, please feel free to write them down, um, send them in through the uh, YouTube chat feature. And our moderator, Ben, will um, allow us some time at the very end where we can do our best to address those. So um, again, this is a part of an, an ongoing outreach for Altium that uh, we're hoping is of value to you. So I encourage you to, uh, you can reload this and watch this at a later time and I encourage you to share it with um, your friends or coworkers. And, but also encourage you to sign up and subscribe to Altium's uh, YouTube channel. Um, Altium's goal is to bring you uh, valuable content to make you successful and, and, and help your company. So uh, with that getting started, um, the title is originally Build, essentially uh, helping you solve EM fields. Um, the title has been evolving as I've coalesced this material together. So kind of somewhat changed it on the fly, place and route, getting it right. Um, my hope is that we'll cover so much material that by the end of this, uh, the last thing you're going to worry about is what the title uh, evolved itself into. But we did add some uh, content on placement, so I'm hoping that's of value to you. So um, again, thank you very much for uh, following along, and let's get started. Um, this slide here just shows a little bit about my background. Um, I, as I mentioned, work for Inselectro. I'm Technical Director of Design Education. Inselectro is a um, distributor for Isola and DuPont and Ormet materials, um, which are used in your, um, the design of your circuits. And I'm going to, at some point, show you some of their product ladders. But uh, uh, whoever you're using for your materials, um, I, I applaud them. I'm sure they're great and I encourage you to continue to use them. Um, I just work for them, so that's what I'm going to show you, but um, it's really not about a pitch for the materials. Um, my hope is that you make technically appropriate decisions with your materials. Um, I also work for EPTEC, which is IPC's North American um, Training Center, uh, teaching the CID and the CID um, curriculum. Um, it also says MIT, which is a master IPC trainer. Um, I work and support the other trainers, and I had the privilege to serve as the primary contributor for the CID Plus curriculum, and along with Gary Ferrari, Rick Hartley, and, and many others on that uh, EPTAC IPC CID team. I also serve in IPC's Designers Council, the executive board. Um, we meet and we support the designers chapters uh, across the, the nation and actually there's quite a few international uh, chapters that exist and we hope that's of value to you. Um, I was the founder of San Diego PCB Design and I had the privilege to sell that company about three years ago and San Diego PCB um, from my opinion is one of the premier service providers uh, utilizing Altium software um, we have consistent uh, uh, employees there that are dedicated to support your needs as they arrive, um, solving you know, your high tech and your high crunch uh, periods of design cycle. Um, the bottom line is that PCB designer for over 43 years, um, I love what I do. I love PCB design and I love Altium. Um, it, it's truly a unique tool in our industry and so and I'm grateful for their efforts to help uh, bring education and uh, uh, training of value to you. So um, 
with that. Um, this slide right here is going to somewhat do the overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, five bullets basically covering some of the design challenges that we face in this modern era. It's oftentimes referred to as the 5G era. Uh, so we're going to cover some of those from just a perspective standpoint. We'll cover materials and why they matter. We'll cover rules and constraints. And I'll explain what the DFM, DFS, DFP stand for. The placement of high density, I just thought it was so important when talking about routes and signal integrity to cover placement. So like I said I brought that into the presentation. And then routing, both all phases of routing and then different types. I mean, there's RF boards, back planes, uh, dense digital, you know, analog. We're going to try to cover a handful of different types, and hopefully that's a value. So this slide right here, I call it the most important slide. And essentially what this slide talks about on the, on the uh, far right side there is the design for. Everyone knows DFM, but it's the DFS, DFP that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, this concept was brought about by the Executive Council and the Designers Council, the Executive Board, and it was basically a determination that we needed a definition that, that pretty much directed us in the right way of per perceiving the PCB design layout function, whether that's done by an engineer or design layout person. We wanted you to look at all these different aspects and not just one. If it's a compartmentalized look, um, you would do so potentially at the expense of the other perspective. So you're going to see this slide, and we made it in those bright, uh, ugly colors uh, or bold colors um, to get your attention with this. Um, now, the paragraph of this has actually uh, been brought about. The IPC Technical Advisory Committee has put it in the 2200 Design Series specifications um, before Chapter 1, Sentence 1. This particular image um, was crafted by a handful of the people in the executive board, and um, it was a pictorial because designers oftentimes like a good picture, and um, it's something I can visualize pretty well. And it was uh, actually uh, coined the name Designer's Triangle by uh, Steph Chavez, who works at uh, Collins Aerospace. Um, the Designer's Triangle, again, it's that you would look at this from all these perspectives, and so that when you're dealing with maximum placement or routing densities, that you'd have the optimal electrical performance, um, that it'd be a efficient and defect-free manufacturability, and you could solve it. So a little breakdown of that, just so you get some of the balanced approach that we want to see in every step of your design. The solvability, okay? With that comes CAD tool proficiency. Okay, now Altium, I've been around Altium since Altium 6, and I've seen it grow. And every time they're adding a depth of functionality, there is a certain proficiency that must be man mastered by you, the user. And they've worked hard to uh, improve the user experience at the same time giving you that proficiency. And some people are novice at their CAD tool or beginners, and some are productive. Some are real proficient, and some are experts or masters. I'm challenging you to truly become a master at your tool. Um, you become valuable to your, um, your company and you know, also value to your own career development. So I'm encouraging you to truly be a master. Um, the solvability, not only is it tool usage, but it starts really at planning and estimating and forecasting, okay? I have to, in my mind, figure out how can I solve this board. I don't want to spend a months or weeks or months trying to get to the point where I think I can solve it. I want to know in advance, can this be solved? Can I place it? Can I route it? Okay. Think of it as a Rubik's Cube. Um, it's truly oftentimes a puzzle to be solved because when you consider these large dense board, the amount and the volume that's in there, it's significant. Okay. The DFP, so I'm referring to signal integrity or EMI, which really when you think about EMI, it's EMI or EMC, that's interference or compliance. So an electromagnetic interference or compliance, meaning will my board be interfered by some other radio signals or will my board interfere? Will I be compliant to some, somebody else's circuitry, okay? 
The other thing for performance could be thermal or it could be the current carrying capacity. Um, so there's oftentimes many different performance um, metrics that we're trying to achieve. Um, so could you picture if I just routed the ground net? I mean, most of you know what a disaster that would be, but I could say I've solved the ground net, but would it perform? Absolutely not. So you all know that example, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm keying in there. So. Our goal is that it's correct by construction. I don't want to use analysis tool at the back end to see if I've done it right. My goal and my intention is to do correct by construction methodologies that I know it'll perform once I'm complete. Thirdly, in the green there, the DFM, the manufacturability. Now, who is that manufacturer? Is it the fabricator? Is it the assembler? Is it the test house? Is it the compliance? Um, you know, is reliability under that? There's quite a few things that you could think of, but essentially what I'm encouraging you here is that with everything, early forecast and communication with your supply chain, okay, both in a prototype and a production scenario, okay, and the materials that you're using and that the manufacturing process allowances can be met. Essentially, prototype, all boards are prototyped, okay. And a prototype essentially is, a way to describe a prototype is I want the max quantity for the limited lot, for the, the minimum lot charge. Max quantity for a minimum lot charge. But the minimum quantity is five or six or whatever that first need might be. And typically when I'm prototyping, the goal of my prototype is to debug my circuit, not the capabilities of a manufacturer's house. So my encouragement is typically to prototype with a high quality manufacturer, okay, that you know is capable of meeting this and performing all the manufacturing so that you can debug your circuit. Now production, what is the size of your production run? Okay, this is one of the first things you should know because it affects so many decisions throughout the course of your layout. Um, will it be, I mean there's kind of different levels to it. Um, a high production, let's say it's a cell phone or something, it could be a million parts per year, that's significant, or a hundred thousand, those are significant production quantities. There every penny counts, okay? And typically you want to do a pilot run to make sure you can build it in production, and that pilot run should be done in your production house, okay? Now you're trying to make sure you can build it as affordably as you can. But maybe that production run is 5,000, 10,000. That's actually typically about a, what's known as a mid-range production, okay? Um, maybe it's production built in the, in the U.S. or in the West, and maybe the higher ones are done in the East. That's just the norm that's in our industry. But let's say you have a type of product that's a low production run, okay? Um, what are you caring about mostly when you're doing that? You're caring about the reliability, okay? Saving a few pennies here and there um, is not as important a lot of times as the reliability because price is what you might save up front, but cost is what you're going to pay in the long run um, when you blow the reliability because your integrity of your company is based on that. So I encourage people that if you're really low production, and when I say low production, a lot of times I'm thinking of, you know, some class three products that are either medical, Eros Mill Aero, or, or some of the medical diagnostic. These are class three, and you know maybe it's a low volume type of a thing where the reliability is the highest criteria. And in those cases, make better material choices, make better fabrication choices, okay? Um, because that little bit of cost savings is better than the reliability hit, okay? So you're gonna make a materials that'll enable those challenges, uh, rules, enable and confirm some of the goals are being implemented. The placement that would anticipate the challenges you're going to encounter, again, from solvability, performance, and manufacturing. And then as you go on to route your board, that you're anticipating these challenges and you're routing with a correct by construction methodology. So this slide, again, working within Selectra, um, they represent DuPont and um, 
they provided this slide because it just kind of shows what has been the evolution in our industry that most of us have lived through or entered into um, this progression, this chronology over time. Um, I've actually been around for majority of it. No, I've been around for all of it. Um, having started in 76, um, I actually have in my garage probably one of each one of those cell phones um, because I've been involved in working in San Diego where this is being recorded. It's also termed Telecom Valley. So I've truly been involved with some of those very large cell phones which were analog in nature, you know, 900 megahertz. And then when I saw them go into basically the Gen 2 and they started becoming digital, that was really exciting and it's when we sent some of the first digital text. I actually generated one of the first digital um, modems that went into an IBM ThinkPad. And then the Gen 3, the 3G really started bringing around where you could actually do voice over, you know, data and you started getting internet connectivity right on your cell phone and uh, they went to color screens, okay. Um, and you, nowadays if you saw the 3G on your phone you're going, oh no, <laughs> you're limited what you can do. But we're excited when we see LTE or 4G on your phone because you know that you now can truly do streaming. You can do data type streaming. You're probably all using a 4G of sorts now. But what nobody likes in a 4G world is when it goes pop, 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 and it's buffering around. <laughs> you're probably sitting in a wrong part of the building or perhaps you're lacking some technology by hardware or something to that effect. But 5G is gonna change that. 5G, um, it's going to basically give you more information um, faster. And essentially, it's kind of like taking a Coke bottle. If you tipped it upside down, it would start coming out. But if you open the Coke bottle much larger, it would all dump out. And that might be a limited analogy for you to pursue that it's going to be able to get a lot of data fast. Okay. And how pervasive is this in, in, in the world in which we live in today? This little cute little image down here um, shows um, just how many places where it's truly becoming and will become uh, in our industry. That previous slide showed us that it's trillions of dollars of money that are, will be invested in the world over 5G and in the um, base of the Internet of Things. Everything from EV, v autonomous cars, smart communities, a smart home, um, industrial internet of things, uh, wearables, mill aero, uh, medical and pharmaceutical, um, you know, stuff like that, transportation, AI, artificial intelligence. I'm just trying to throw a lot of things to get your head thinking that it will be pervasive, okay? And it'll allow us as um, consumers to access more information faster. Um, it's going to be taking a while to roll out. Um, what you're going to see here is essentially on this next slide. I put this slide up because it's colorful and I like it. Okay. Um, what it shows is um, some of the frequency allocations that um, exist across the planet. And it shows some of the different bandwidths that you might encounter. Um, and to just give you a quick overview, if you had an AM radio, that's probably a thousand or below. If you had an FM radio, that's 10,000 to 1,000. Okay, and you've heard of UHF, VHF, um, and then basically the um, the microwave, which is kind of a, actually a broad term, but more specifically the millimeter wave is where the 5G will come in, and we'll just briefly talk on that. Um, and we'll see essentially this next slide shows us some of the different frequency um, groupings, if you would. But what you learn about looking at a frequency chart is we're all familiar with an oscillate, uh, uh, oscillating sine wave, essentially whereby a signal repeats itself. The line there says that a wavelength is the spatial period of a periodic wave, the distance over which a wave's shape repeats itself. Okay? On a digital board, that's happening on our circuit, but in an RF circuit, it's happening over the air. Okay? And there's radio waves. Uh, most of us are probably somehow connected to radio waves all the time through Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, and cellular. In particular, the microwaves, um, like I said, is a general thing, a general parameter for it. Um, but 5G will occur in the millimeter wave. So you can see it right in the middle of that, that EHF, extremely high frequency. So it's about in that 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. 
but it has a wavelength range of one centimeter to one millimeter, and then it repeats. Okay, so there's been some problems with that, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, in, as far as the 30 to 300 gigahertz, I believe that there'll be some phased implementation of those frequencies and utilization of that frequency allocation space. But um, I'll let somebody else talk about that. I just kind of want to give you an exposure to it. Um, these slides I garnered from uh, Wikipedia, courtesy of them. It gives you somewhat of an idea how perhaps a millimeter wave band um, would operate or form, okay? And basically for the longest time they were considered unsuitable for mobile communications, mainly due to the, some of the high loss and propagation issues that they occurred. And some of these concerns are being solved with the development of phased array or beam steering or beam forming antennas. And I encourage you to look up some of these images because they're animated and as a GIF you start to see exactly how they perform and it's kind of intriguing but you see on the one on the far right there essentially it would be a multi-point the far two on the left or the right um, would be multiple antenna points that are broadcasting and it's a moving type pattern whereby when it encounters something and relays back I've encountered something it works to get around it. Think of that. It's kind of a a loose interpretation for you on that, okay? And um, typically they're broadcast from some sort of an antenna. Now, typically one of the challenges with cellular and, and radio frequency waves is that there's a limited range, okay? We already talked about that. So oftentimes there's repeaters that are brought out there. If your cell phone's heating up, you're probably outside of the range of the cell site, and therefore it's working hard, taxing your battery, to receive that cell site, okay? Or many of you have too many apps running in the background, but to draw your attention to this, what I'm trying to get at is that the high-speed digital signals, they're on your board, okay? And essentially, both high-speed digital and RF have frequencies of operation, and they have data bandwidth, how much can they send, okay? And although the high-speed digitals are on your board and the RF emanates from your board, okay, the RF actually travels over the air, okay? And so there's a different set of parameters for that, and you're really not managing that frequency on your board. You're managing, from an RF perspective, the loss as they modulate to transmit or receive an RF signal. So fighting factors of loss is what's of value to your RF circuit, okay? Whereas digitally, you're truly managing the cycle time on there and the rise time whereby you're delivering the energy for that cycle. So high-speed signals and large bandwidth data. Um, to, bake, to break this down a little bit, you hear gigahertz and you hear gigabits. Okay, so we're going to talk just a little bit about that. The gigahertz at the bottom there, it's an operational switching frequency whereby it's repeating its cycle. The gigabits, okay, think of it as ones and zeros, eight bits to a byte. It's an octal language. It's a binary language of one or zero. And you could have how many bytes or bits per lane. This is an amount of data as opposed to a switching frequency. Now you could have one or multiple lanes of this data, and it could be bidirectional, thus transmit and receive, in which case the gigabits would be doubled because you have a transmit and a receive. So thinking of, understanding the difference between gigabits and gigahertz, I think is helpful for you. Um, so when we start talking about some of the different high-speed digital, um, let's just say categories or families, PCI Express. Most of us have been dealing with one and two already, and some of you perhaps into that three already. But no, as you can see, that they're all coming and it's planned and you see the raw bit rate and then some, some of the link and, and, and how much with the bit rate per lane. And again, you could have multiple lanes for an accumulated um, transmission. But uh, this is the amount of data that you're able to transmit in the gigahertz, consider as a switching frequency, how fast can I transmit large data, okay? So gigabit ethernet, um, there's a handful of different protocols that do exist in the high-speed world. Um, so I'm just trying to give a brief overview on that. So what does that mean for us? 
You know, as, as speed and performance increase, so does heat. And when I looked at this slide, it's like, which one comes first? I, I'm not going to worry about that. I'll let somebody else maybe talk about that. But know that the heat's showing up. Okay, so that means I had to probably lower my voltage. Okay, so as the voltage dropped, guess what happened? They wanted to add more functionality, more gates. Therefore, the size and the pin pitch got reduced because they, they were lowering the voltage and they had to shrink it. But they also wanted to increase the functionality, so they added more pins. So the pin count often increases. So all of those are happening simultaneously. Thus, you're seeing larger pin count devices. And you're also seeing smaller pin pitch. Okay, And as all those convergences are happening, they threaten the heat profile of our board, and heat is not our friend. We need to know that. So, so as you're seeing there, if you've got any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat and write them down as you think of them, and we'll try to address them on the back end. So um, all of these challenges we're talking about, okay, they lead us to an, some advanced solutions. So just to kind of cover them loosely here, um, an increased placement density. Does that mean that I need to use, utilize a VIA in pad or perhaps some sort of embedded component? Perhaps. Uh, maybe power delivery challenges, you know, or smart stackups with buried capacitance. As frequencies are increasing, I'm finding that the current requirements to drive some of these devices is going extremely high. I've done a couple of 60 amp high speed digital boards, and I'm sure some of you have done way more than that. But that's a serious amount of current that we're trying to push through our board, okay? Um, and that's a collective uh, number, too, of all the devices, typically. Um, so increased routing density, we've talked about that. And when I say HDI, and we're going to talk about HDI a little bit later on, some of the specifics. Most people think HDI, they think, oh, laser vias. Well, laser vias are just one of the uh, avenues or, or perspectives for HDI. So we're going to try to look at a few other ones, okay? Um, I already mentioned VIA in pad. So to me, that is an HDI. It's a higher density, okay? We'll cover that a little bit. Um, as the density increases, the signal integrity, okay, issues are becoming more critical simply because there's a faster switching circuitry. And that actually is going to help with, or, or should I say, make worse the EMI concerns that we're faced with. Okay. Um, at the same time, now my, as I shrink my devices, I'm challenging all the more the manufacturing concerns. So I already mentioned the current carrying capacities. And oh, at the very bottom there, <laughs> did I mention this whole project's got to cost less and you have to complete this circuit faster? Um, good luck with all that. <laughs> Those challenges are real. And so I'm hoping that you're going to find some value in this today and you can implement this um, and meet these challenges. So let's keep going here, talking about some of the challenges. Um, what does it mean when you are routing these signals? Okay. Um, essentially, the margin for error is significantly reduced. And what used to be tolerated cannot be tolerated anymore. I used to be able to drive a signal from this IC and send it across the room, oh, pick a number, 10 feet away, 15 feet away, and I'd send over that 5 or 12 volt signal, and there's 5 volts showing up tomorrow. But it's happy because it's got, it's distributed. Basically, what I sent made it over there, and the length didn't play a part. But with the timing margins um, today, um, between signals and buses, essentially when we'll look at the rise time is the burst of energy only provides enough energy to travel so far. So we're going to take a look at that. And therefore, anything I might incur along the way, for example, um, impedance discontinuity. Uh, an impedance con discontinuity could be if I take a trace, instead of routing it like this, that if all of a sudden I split it and I go two ways, my 50 ohm line became 225s. And each signal needed to receive a 50 ohm um, signal. And if it didn't get it, now it sends a reflection back up the line, perhaps, and I have a signal integrity issue. Um, or if it goes across a split plane, we'll talk about that. Any kind of loss of a ground return path, 
okay, for your signal could, not could, but will provide a signal integrity concern or issue at today's speeds, okay? I'm trying to really change that thinking, not could, but it most probably will. So, and I'm saying the same thing about power rails also. Every power rail you do should have a, a complete, perfect, uninterrupted return path one adjacent layer away. Every signal should have an uninterrupted ground return path one, minimum one, signal layer away, okay? We'll talk about power planes. Uh, I'll talk about it now. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not a power plane can serve as a return path, and I get the fundamentals of that, that yes, it can, okay? But that assumes that it's too tightly coupled, a power plane with a ground plane, okay? And that assumes that every signal on this layer is of that same voltage. Mm, I can't guarantee that. And then it also assumes you didn't route with any split planes, which you probably did. So therefore, I'd have an interrupted return path. All that to say is, I don't want to play for failure. So I'm encouraging you to always make it a ground return path. And I've done enough circuits in my day to say that I'm up for this challenge. I don't want to route against a power plane. It is my last choice. I want to make it a ground plane. So my opinion, um, I'm trying to teach you how to be successful. Um, because what we don't want, uh, any kind of parasitic adders, so in a, a via stub or a land, um, all could be parasitic, meaning that essentially it might give you an added capacitance or an inductance change that you just didn't anticipate or didn't want, okay? All that would basically say that if I've got some sort of impedance discontinuity, that I could get unwanted EMI from any unshielded circuits or circuits that are not performing well from a signal integrity standpoint. Um, but unwanted EMI, I'm, I covered this earlier, that it's, it's going out or it's coming in. And so you want to ensure both of them. So signal integrity is ensuring that you don't create signal noise. And EMI EMC is basically creating an environment whereby uh, you do not emit to the outer world. So all of our filtered power requirements need to be met also. Current voltage, making sure there's no fuses, tiny little links, okay? Also, what can't be tolerated is any design or manufacturing process issues degrading the long-term reliability. Um, the via is the most vulnerable thing on your board. It's plating thickness, it's potential for a barrel crack or a crack at the seam where it, where it hits the surface or any layer. I mean, some of these dense boards, you're going to see some here that there are 10,000 vias on 12, 18 layers. Do the math on that. It's a significant amount of potential places for failure. And when they fail, they basically fail under a thermal excursion when it's heated. But then when it cools down, it comes back together. Thus, it's intermittent. And it'll show up again next time you heat your board up, meaning when you use it, so you test it cold and it's good, but then you go to use it and it fails. And you can't identify where this is. So building things with reliability, and especially in the VIA area, is one of those long-term reliabilities that I'm encouraging you to consider well into placement and routing and signal constraints. So signal integrity with faster switching circuitry. Um, if you've ever sat through one of uh, Rick Hartley's presentation, um, he did the uh, a YouTube uh, a live YouTube yesterday, which I encourage you to get out and visit it. Um, again, subscribing to that, you get alerted whenever these occur. Or if you've attended any of these, I'm not going to try to reteach all that. What I'm trying to do is teach you how to apply that knowledge and make it correct by construction, so that you don't violate the concerns that we're up against. Um, Essentially, that people, when I ask them, how fast is your circuit, and they say, oh, it's so many megahertz or something to that effect. What they're talking about, essentially, is in this image right here would be the cycle time by which it starts and then completes, and that's a cycle time, where it runs through a full cycle of a rise and a fall, okay? But that is basically one, it's a, it's a variable in the equation of how fast your circuit is. But what is of criticality to you 
is the rise time. And the rise time is shown essentially right in here, and this part right here was how quickly will the, the signal going from, an, we say ground or even zero voltage, which can be misleading, because the second it hits a current field, the voltage is no longer zero, but starting at a reference point, let's say of zero, switching to what its switching speed is, okay, you want a square wave as best you can get it, okay? This is ones and zeros, this is digital switching. But all the energy that that signal is going to get is only in that rise time. So you can see a lot of times is if, if you pictured an accordion to, to, to this thing right here, this, this, this image I'm showing you, um, this one right here, not the other one, <laughs> to that image, as the frequency compacts, essentially they're lowering the voltage and that's increasing that angle for the rise time. And what are fast rise times, okay? Essentially nowadays, signals, the majority of signals are somewhere in that one to two nanosecond they're all in that range, but there's a high amount of circuitry in, in today's circuitry that is high speed, which is, is sub nanosecond down into the picosecond range, okay, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. One nanosecond essentially would be 150 millimeters of distance, whereby that signal can travel and have probably no loss but it's also concerned that it had no impedance discontinuities along the way. Because any discontinuities might lose some energy and therefore when the signal arrives, did it get the exact amount of voltage and cause no reflections going back? That's what you're essentially um, trying to pursue. But if you could see if you had a, you know, a 0.5, you're down to about a three inch signal. And if you exceed that length, you're pushing the margin for performance and you don't want to do that. So. Now, we're not just really charting one cycle. You see in, in the lower images, the green and the red there, essentially what we're charting is an eye diagram showing these signals and sometimes differential pairs switching in the gigahertz, which is billions per second. And so therefore it's the repeated cycles and they wanna see is it performing truly over all those cycles. And when it doesn't, basically the rising and the falling edges don't re meet right in the middle and you get a skew between the two, and that affects the performance and causes your high-speed circuit not to work. This one right here, um, materials matter, okay? Um, signal propagation and return, which is basically the energy moving forward and backwards, okay? Now when I tell that to people, they think this image right here, okay, that it's forward and backwards. Now, you see I've got a driver and I've got a, uh, a receiver on that end. And you see the little resistor and inductive. That's really meant to show a trace which has a resistive property and an inductive property to it. And then you see the ground symbol underneath and you see the inductor and the capacitor. That's to show you the basic relationship between your signal as it travels over a ground plane. Okay, assuming that's the plane, there's the signal. It's what's happening in the middle. And when people say forward and return, they think it's going down and coming back. And that's a misnomer. Um, essentially, the fields exist in the dielectric material. Okay? And you can see right there that essentially it's immediate. I mean, this is why I chose the job at Inselectro because they're, they're dealing with high-speed materials. And as an educator, I truly wanted to convey this message to help the designers of today be, be successful because your fields, you're no longer just routing a trace, you're managing a field. And that field is relative of your signal to ground. It lives within the dielectric material. So you can see a differential pair on the lower image there, essentially um, is, you know, this one right, the, the one down here, the bottom. Most of it is, um, you need to understand how this works. So this image will show this. So the top one shows a single ended characteristic impedance. And the pink color essentially is the capacitive field, the electro field, so EM, electro. The green is showing the magnetic field, and it uses what's known as the right-hand rule of thumb, um, kind of like you were hitchhiking. Um, people don't hitchhike anymore, it's just not right. Um, as the signal goes in this direction, the wave around it would go in this direction. 
Okay, so that's what that's indicating, showing you which direction the signal is going from driver to receiver. And these fields are basically contained based on their environment. If they're between two signals, it's much more controlled. Two, or two plane layers or two metalized layers on either side, you've contained it. Okay, and whereas the one on the bottom shows a differential. And really, if that's a 50 ohm one on the top, the one on the bottom essentially is um, maybe 245 ohms with 10 ohms of differential between them. So collectively, it's a 100 ohm differential pair. But primarily, it's two single-ended 50 ohm lines, probably 45. Um, and if you've attended any of Rick, uh, Rick Hartley's classes or Lee Ritchie, you know, Two differential signals separating probably is just not as high of a magnitude of concern as to them having equal lengths, okay? Um, but with the automation of today's tool, pff, I challenge you, you can make these things differential. And we'll cover that at the end of routing. So, um, but I want you to be aware of, of the electro and the magnetic fields. Um, so that's what you're managing. Now this image up on the top there shows that if a signal in the top uh, image essentially was this one right up on the top was to cross a split plane, what happens to its return field? Will it jump across the split? The answer is no, it won't. What it's going to do, it's going to dip around and it's going to attempt to catch up. And any signal that's down in that area will receive some sort of spurious noise or energy field that will give it signal integrity or a crosstalk type of thing where you've coupled two energy fields from two different signals together. So don't do it. Don't route over a split plane. The bottom image there essentially is telling you that it's a better practice to route around the split and then therefore the energy field will follow with it. Just do that. It's, if someone's asking you to route it now, if one side is an uninterrupted ground plane and then here's your signal, and then up here is another plane, it's a split plane. I'm okay with traversing split planes as long as one of them is an uninterrupted ground return path, okay? So I get it, the need for split planes occur, but you want that, most of that field will be drawn essentially, as this image shows, to its return path. And that's what you're aiming for right there. And I'm an advocate of making it zero voltage ground. So there's a couple of illustrations just to show how these things might perform and so how we can visualize it. Um, the electromagnetic field. I live in San Diego County, an arid um, place. It's essentially, it's a desert that we've irrigated. Um, but I truly at nighttime can scuff my feet on a carpet, walk up to that poor little kitty cat and give that kitty the fear of God <laughs> by just going about an inch from its nose and you can see at nighttime, it's better to do it at nighttime, you'll see that spark jump to the poor kitty's nose and that kitty now respects you and fears you. So um, bear with the silly image. Same thing might be said if you bought a house underneath a high wire. Now typically they, they attempt to give all the return path required um, in the high wire, but you get my point. You just, it, it's more of a, perhaps a perception thing than a reality, but Maybe those people have a hard time making cell calls from their house. I don't know. Their old style TVs probably had antenna problems. Um, I'll, I'll let your, your mind wander with that. But the important point I want you to do to remember is that your energy field exists between the trace and the return path within the dielectric material. Okay? And air has that dielectric constant of one, where most of our FR materials are four. Okay, so it's a 25% um, as good as air. So air basically can conduct electricity better, okay? Now the high speed materials are getting down into the three, the low threes, okay? And uh, we'll cover some of those a little bit later on. So as we go into materials, um, let's just jump right into here. Um, working for uh, Inselectro, I'm gonna show you Isola's product ladder here. Now, do you maybe use Isola? Maybe you don't. I'm sure you have a materials provider and I applaud your use of them. Um, I'm encouraging you to use them. If you're successful, love it. Um, but know what their product line has, okay? I'm showing you what I have simply because I work for them. 
Uh, so bear with this slide being out here. Um, but the goal is I want you to see that there are electrical properties and there are physical properties. And in theory, not in theory, in actuality, there are solvability. So I want you to see that triangle in the lower thing that when I make a material selection, solvability means maybe I have HDI where I need thin material, okay? Maybe I'm considering micro traces, okay? Um, maybe micro vias. Those are all factors of thin material where the, the material is playing a part just in the solvability. The performance. We've covered e, signal integrity, EMI, or power delivery. Okay, All those things could affect the thermal um, power or signal integrity performance. The material can do that. Typically, you're seeing the dielectric constant um, ranging from 3 to 4. Okay, You're seeing perhaps the loss, the DF. Okay, or basically what type of uh, loss does your signal incur? Your RF engineers typically will care a lot about the loss. And um, whether or not the copper plays a big factor in that too. Copper typically has a smooth side and it has a rough side which it uses for adhesion to hold on to the, um, the uh, organic material below it. Um, but that's a rough side and that basically um, it has an effect towards the skin effect when the signal current is traveling on the surface of the metal. It's not going through your planes or your signal, it's riding on the surface and therefore the rougher side has basically um, more loss to it. So there's copper comes in very different loss profiles. So explore that. See if that's applicable to your circumstance or your circuit. The last thing, the DFM for material, anything from the coefficient of thermal expansion um, to plating. Oftentimes you'll see a couple things like the TG, okay, or the TD. The TG essentially is it's called glass transition. But actually, most of your um, epoxy-based materials are glass and resin. And the glass expands in the X and Y, but the resin okay, expands in the Z axis. Okay? And that is actually more um, detrimental because your boards are very thin, but they can be very big. So it's a parts per million equation that says Z axis is more concerned for you. And the, factor that you're looking at a lot of times with that is the T sub G. Uh, again, it's the resin transitioning from that rubbery state to a hardened state. Okay, and Typically, high layer count boards, maybe you might consider a high T sub G. Um, with Rojas, a lot of people were concerned about, you know, T sub G. Got nothing to do with the T sub G, really. It's the T sub D, which is the decomposition, where if I do a high layer count, I truly might um, subject my circuit to multiple lamination cycles, which might truly stress the material to the point where it might decompose. So if you truly have that scenario, pay attention to the T sub D. So plating, copper surfaces, how process friendly is it, how reliable is it, these are all concerns, again, talking with your manufacturing supply chain um, early. These slides here are talking about flex and some of the buried capacitance material. So again, it's a product ladder uh, showing you some of the different types that are out there as you consider it. Um, essentially, this is the Pyrolex family here for the most part. And um, you want to brag about something like the Pyrolex uh, AP. Um, it's one of the most reliable um, materials that, are exist that exists. Um, I say that because I know it's on the, uh, on the Mars rover, okay? And that thing has so far exceeded its life expectancies, and, and, and I'm, I'm sure that DuPont is quite proud of the fact that AP has contributed to that success, so shout out to our friends on Mars. Um, the AG is a lower cost, the HT is a higher temp, the TK um, is, a, is a high speed, essentially, you know, there's a little bit of a, a Teflon inserted into there. But most of these materials um, are a polyamide base, therefore their temperature, their, their uh, ability to withhold a higher temperature is way more increased than your regular laminates. Um, so the other one down at the bottom there is the Intera, which is a buried capacitance material. Very low DK, very thin um, with a high copper, great for providing a um, power delivery, part of the power delivery. I'll show you a slide or two of that later. 
I had to slip in a few slides on flex design, okay? Um, so just a couple, just to cover it. Um, they're sometimes single-sided on your top right there where you're just running a circuit out on one, one layer. And it's oftentimes a replacement for connectors or something to that effect. Um, if you wanted to add a component, you'd have to add a stiffener underneath it for the rigidity so your solder joint wouldn't be threatened. Um, you could have a double-sided or even a multi-layer type 3 down there where truly multi, multiple layers are going up. Or fourth, you see what's known as a rigid flex or rigid flex rigid, whereby you've got two rigid boards and they're interconnected by, in this case, you're seeing three double-sided layers. And they're actually separated a little bit to give them more flexibility, okay? Um, a loose leaf type of thing that truly increases the ability to bend it. And that's what a flex uh, major value is, the ability for it to bend and adapt to different physical um, circumstances. Um, and it can just, again, reduce uh, connectors, which can improve reliability, lower costs, etc. One of the things when you consider a, a flex, and flex is a smaller percentage of the overall uh, design layout market space, but is there's two types of constructions. Um, essentially, there's always a capton layer and then, uh, of course, you have your metal, but the two types, essentially, one uses an adhesive, as shown in, in this slide right here, an adhesive layer to bond the metal to it, okay? And the adhesive has some electrical properties and, and structural properties that should be known and observed. And then some of the other Pyrolex um, things are adhesive-less, okay, whereby you don't, do not require the adhesive layer in there. And it gives you the ability sometimes to do some of the uh, high temp or maybe some of the high speed um, laminates. So take a look at that, but most of all, talk with your fabricator early. Don't make the materials decision about flex be the last thing you do. Make it be the first thing you do when designing a flex circuit. Make sure they've got it in stock and that they're proficient in using on it. And if you're determined to do it, gives them a little time to practice while you're still doing the design make sure they work out all their process on their line so communicate early to your fabricators when considering this and definitely consider it early in the cycle i threw this on just because i want you to ensure that your high speed signals or even an rf signal performed well over a flex if i just send a signal across a flex from a rigid to another rigid over there um, and I didn't provide a return path for it, I could be broadcasting, and I don't want to do that. And I could be losing its performance, okay? Don't want to do that. So what I'm showing you is on a two-layer flex, the red is on one layer, calling it the flex layer one, where the signal exists. On the other layer, a little bit lower down, essentially I'm doing two things. I'm making a 45-degree hatch pattern, and I'm also making a shadow ground trace that would run directly underneath my trace, okay? And you can, you, you can see it right there. I always point with the wrong finger, so bear with me. Um, that I want the shadow trace to provide a return path. So if I have, say, maybe one width of one, the shadow trace would be maybe 3x, okay? And the hatch pattern provides the ability to um, flex my board still, because if I put a complete row of copper across there, a solid piece of copper, it might be hard to flex. It might lose some of its um, mobility that what flex is uh, valued for. So it provides a bit of an EM shield and then the black on, on there. And they're all hooked to ground, so it's all on the bottom layer. So um, flex layer two. Okay. Um, so let's move on here and just kind of keep in track of my time. Um, rules. Who defines the rules and where do they come from, okay? Um, if you're the double E doing this, you're saying, I do all of it, and good for you. And I'm gonna encourage you that by the time you're done with this session, you won't be saying you do it all because you're probably not the fabricator, okay? If you're the layout person, you have three people contributing to this. Okay, and we're going to take a look at just that and where they come from. So you see the triangle down there. I want you to look at this from a solvability. Picture the layout person. If you're the person putting on your layout, um, design layout hat, you have to solve this. So you need a certain amount of rules that allow you to pin escape and to traverse a via, what size. Will it work with the components I've selected? 
and um, what's the trace in space to solve this route, okay? Now, sometimes there's a minimum criteria and then there's a preferred. We'll talk about that in a second. The next thing might be the electrical performance. So let's put on your engineering cap and you're over on the right doing the schematic. Maybe you're gonna put some of the electrical performance criteria in there, okay? Whether it's a match delay, which is a, you know, a, it's a timing scenario that is now in all times measured by delay, but it's also equates to a distance, okay? Um, Crosstalk would be two signals talking to one another or the impedance to make sure it's routed um, and achieve the impedance you desire for performance. Differential pairs, buses, etc. There could be many things that establish electrical performance, okay? And then DFX. Is this compatible with your manufacturing capabilities? Not some company you used to work with or the fabricator you used to know or what you think they should do. Because oftentimes if you approach any of your fabricators and you ask them for a capabilities matrix, they're going to probably give you a piece of paper or however they deliver it to you and it'll show you essentially what is high reliability and then they're going to say standard and then up at the top is going to be um, next gen or cutting edge or however they want to call it. Um, but essentially it's what they'd like to be doing tomorrow and they're trying to lure you in and they'd love to do a science experiment on your board. Um, it concerns me. <laughs> so um, I want to make sure that their manufacturing traces and spaces are compatible with what I need to pin escape do my solvability. They don't know the solvability challenges you face. They don't know. They don't know the performance. They know their perspective. So you must look at all three of these simultaneously, okay, as we do it. So you've seen that schematic image right there. We're going to talk about what do we get from that and pass into the layout tool. Now, what is so cool, and I've, and I've shown it with this, this uh, cute little slide with the two computers. I mean, if you don't have two monitors, get them. <laughs> and if you don't have three, you know, you basically uh, you have a little techno envy for the guy that does have that. Um, Basically, the user interface is the same on both the schematic and the layout session, and, and that's part of the elegance and proficiency of using Altium, is that that same user interface, that I'm saying the same thing in one truly collaborative tool. So when we consider making our rules, um, you want to simplify the rules definition. Avoid over-constraining this. I actually like to strip it out completely and then pour through my schematic and I'm going to go back here a slide, whoops, I'm going to go back um, right there, that one. I'm going to go by, sorry about that, um, I'm going to go through schematic page by page, circuit by circuit and, and grab rules from every net on my board. I'll explain that in a second, sorry for the flipping through the slides quickly. Um, use the rules for DRC and visual control. You're going to control your signals by that. Okay, you can set a rule on it. You don't have to set a rule. Sometimes just putting it in a class, I can use it for a display purpose. Okay, um, and also avoid ignoring rule violations. Strive for correct by construction. I truly believe that if you define your rules, and we're going to talk about grid base here, that you truly can do that so that you have minimal DRCs at the end. That is an ideal design cycle, that you have minimal and you know, you're not swimming through thousands of them. You want to reduce that type of uh, design practice. Okay? And again, I'm going to put most of my nets in some sort of a class, whether it's power, critical, differential pair, buses, a passive signal like a JTAG or a reset line. Okay, um, or aggressor, you know, something that I know is volatile and being in proximity to other signals could create some sort of parasitic crosstalk. And again, these constraints could be rules or they could just be for display purposes. I could add color coding. I want to talk about that. I mean, uh, for me, the most important net on the board is ground. So to me, it begins with a G, ground is green. And you're going to actually be able to look at some of these slides later on and you can see which net is ground from across the room 
and you can say, oh, they missed that mounting hole. It's not connected to ground or that thermal tab at the center. So this right here, when you're considering a stack up, okay, people use this term black magic for stack ups. I'm not a big fan of that, okay, because black magic is trying to paint the scenario that there's a whole bunch we just don't understand. Therefore, don't challenge, don't question, don't think you can do something correct by construction. I'm just not a fan of that approach, okay? What I'm telling you, when you make a stack up, um, essentially, if you can sketch, I'm, and I've sketched this stack up right here, um, you can sketch um, a resistor symbol on any signal to a ground plane, and that's your way of ensuring, you see it, you know, right here, okay, that, that you're, it'll have an uninterrupted return path, okay? And the same thing with a power plane. Now, I've ba basically backfilled a couple of these signals. Let's see, like right here. That's a power plane. That's a power plane. And so here I'm trying to show you add a, some sort of uh, capacitive symbol. That tells you that you're coupling to a ground, okay? Never leave a power plane sitting out by itself with no adjacent plane. You're just basically sending all your signals between the power and the ground and mixing them in with the harmonics of that power plane. It's just bad practice. Okay, so both a power and a signal should be one power plane uh, away from an uninterrupted return path. So, and I'll probably repeat that last sentence. Um, ground or zero voltage, and again, I'm using that for the sake of reference here, um, is the most important signal on the circuit, okay? Um, it, now, ground is really where you plant tomatoes. I grew up in Illinois. I get what good dirt can do for me. But we commonly refer to this as ground or zero voltage. Um, once an energy field hits it, it's actually its voltage can be moving. But for the sake of our understanding, let's consider it zero. Because every signal is driven at a voltage relative to zero. So um, let's go with that analogy for now. And uh, if you had a chance to attend Rick's um, webinar yesterday, he talked a significant amount of time about ground and return paths. So I've painted in green there in that text. Um, to me, green, green is ground. Uh, ground is green. So um, essentially every signal should have an uninterrupted, never out over splits, reference to ground. Okay, And the same thing in the bullet below it is every power or voltage rail should have an uninterrupted return path. Don't run over a split in a ground plane. In two different ground planes with a split between them, never run over. You will lose your return path, okay? So if you get these last two bullets right, you've solved the majority, a significant amount of your signal and power integrity concerns. It's correct by construction. I want to use an analysis tool if you were so disposed to do so. It's actually challenging. If I was to use it, I want to use it to prove I did it right, not to prove that I did it wrong. So make it correct by construction by observing these principles, and I think it's going to help you. This is another pet peeve of mine. Um, we do dense digital boards, and we so often make what I call a dual asymmetrical stack up. And I'm not a fan of these, and I'm going to explain why. Okay, You can conceptualize this, and you can set up a, a, a stack up. You secure a stack up from the fabricator, and he goes, yeah, I can build that. Okay, you make your fabrication drawing to reflect this. You can even require your fabricator to utilize an impedance coupon based on this stack up. You're going to even require them to give you a TDR, okay, test coupon and test results, okay. You set up your rules, the simulations to consider these as two 50 ohm single ended asymmetrical. They're on different layers. So you see it all modeled there. That's wonderful, except, but, anytime someone says but, what comes afterwards is uh, more important than what went before. Because the board routing was so dense, because alternating layers perpendicular routing strategy, that went out with through-hole technology. It just doesn't exist, alternating uh, layers. Uh, why does it not exist? Take a look at this example here with the BGA. You're doing what's known as a wagon wheel style fan out, where from the center of the BGA, you're going to route in the lower quadrants down and out, and you're going to route in the upper quadrants up and out. And you can't afford to take the lower right and send it over the lower left. It would double the layer usage. 
So you can't do it. So this, this routed example shows that. Therefore, because you've allocated every signal layer, and how do I do that? I mean, I'll get asked the question, how do you determine a stack up? In looking at this image right here, what you're seeing is you can see the ground in the center right here, right? You can make out the ground and the voltage. That's the core voltage. And then you see the blue out here in, in the outer quadrants of this. Essentially, those are the signal layers. I can count how many blue layers. Yes, there's power and ground. It's dispersed because it's a good IC. But you can count the amount of blue signal pins are out there. That tells you how many signal layers you need. And if I know my environment is two between, which we'll cover that in a minute, I know that I can allocate a certain amount of layers. And then I allocate the amount of return path below it. And then I backfill my signal layers with power. That's how I can determine my stack up. And I'll cover that a little bit later. Okay. But when push comes to shove, if you've done an asymmetrical dual stack up, like this slide is talking about, in all actuality, you're going to fill up all four slots. You're not going to do it like the previous one. You're not going to route it like that. It's too dense. You're going to route all four, and therefore you can see how the trace routed next to the victim, okay, down here. And so basically the crosstalk is a broadside couple that will change your impedance, and at the same time, if one of those perhaps was a power plane, it has no reference, okay, to ground. So they will create signal integrity problems and by crosstalk, and they will also create them by violating impedance, okay? Um, now, at the same time, what did your fabricator do? He delivered you that TDR coupon and report, okay, and he shows no problems. The problem is you didn't follow your TDR and impedance um, coupon request. So don't do this. You say, well, but, but you say, Mike, I got so dense of boards, and I'm like, I get that. This is a real challenge, and if you're in a low layer count, high density, this is a real problem you're up against. Good luck, <laughs> but just know you're fighting these problems is what I'm trying to tell you. So thank you for listening to that. Placement. Let's cover placement. Now I'm showing you a couple of very dense boards here um, just to show you that typically at the center is where that density will occur. And I'm just trying to show you some big numbers here of an 18 to 22 layers. Maybe it's DDR345. Some of the BGAs are maybe 1,500 to 2,000 pin pitch. And maybe there's 3,000 to 5,000 components or 50,000 VS. Those are significant numbers. Okay. How would you like to get to the end of this and find out it won't perform or you can't build it? You don't want to get there. So keep an observance to those three perspectives of the designer's triangle to make sure it's correct by construction. So let's look at some of these. When you're in doing placement, you want to understand the end customer's requirements. Okay, and this board, what is the production quantity? We talked about that earlier. If it's truly a high profile, every penny counts. Or excuse me, a high production quant, high production count, every penny will count. Okay, um, but if it's a lower production, then maybe their concern is reliability. Okay, so I want to learn that. If it's high production, every penny counts. Maybe the assembly profile might change. Okay, what are the end? environmental concerns. I mean, I've done some boards that have to operate in Alaska and in Saudi Arabia. It's two extremes, thermal conditions in operation, or under the hood in automotive, or downhill drilling, or up in space, okay? These are all thermal environments and uh, signal emission requirements, so that you should know what your end product and customer's requirements are. So you're going to plan for the following profiles from assem fabrication, assembly, test, debug. Talk to the debug person. Go find that person in the lab and say, how does this placement look? Can you gain access to what you need to? And then you're going to meet mechanical fixed locations. You get that maybe a 3D step file or however you bring it in. But there's X, Y, and Z. Um, connector locations, mounting requirements, um, maybe there's layer keepouts, maybe there's component keepouts or route keepouts. Um, you need to understand the function of each device that you place on your board. If it's high speed, maybe get it close to the I.O. as you bring it on the board. If it needs to traverse the whole board and get out to another I.O. on the top side, you need to know what that overall flow might look like. Okay, And as I'm placing a board, I need to consider my routing during placement. I want to think through every route 
okay, specifically every via pin escape to an SMD pad. So especially that. Um, so the outers, I want to totally hand groom, and I'm going to show you some nice examples of that. Now, most designs, mechanical constraints, they're going to determine your placement somewhat because um, you get some fixed components, connectors, maybe height constraints. Um, electrical parameters will influence. There's a lot of things that are going to, right off the beginning, tell you that. And maybe you need to place all your components on one side because it'll lower your assembly costs. Okay? Maybe you want to put all the components on one side, uh, the large components there, and the small ones on the bottom because there's a better assembly profile than large on both sides. Okay? And again, you want to call your fabricator and we're going to show you how to do that early on in the design cycle and let them weigh in on, on this bullet right here, this uh, whether or not large and, just, and small on which side of the board. But maybe you're going to consider at the very beginning reducing the case size for most discrete devices. Okay? Assuming there's similar value, if someone gives you basically an 0603 and you want to make them an 0402, now those numbers are an inch base number. And a component really is not 40 mils by 20 mils, that's a round off, but it is exactly a 1005, it's a millimeter by a half a millimeter, so that's a very accurate number. Um, we'll talk about round offs later. Um, you may want to drop to a smaller case size. But you want to make sure that all the parameters can be dropped. Some resistors you can't drop because of the, the wattage. They're not available. Um, and maybe capacitors, sometimes there's an inductive uh, parameter to the footprint in the way the device is done, and maybe it won't perform. So you need to evaluate it. Don't just do a wholesale. But most of your 1,005 discrete components were meant to place one by one on a one millimeter pitch BGA. They will map perfectly. No round off. Um, and the larger one that's, a, that's above that essentially uh, is not going to match up. Maybe one of the strategies you're going to look at is utilizing a, a via in pad routing. Yes, this is a cost adder to the bare board, but it has, may have better signal performance. Maybe it allows you to truly, and I'm going to show you an example later, um, truly get all the parts on the board. Okay. So with all your components, grid-based placement is helpful for consistent component alignment, circuit routability, testability. Um, I'm a big fan of grid-based placement. And I know if you listen to Susie um, recording, she talked a lot about that also. So most designers like that. And I'm going to talk about a via grid at some point. Um, it can improve sometimes your nodal access for test fixtures too. Um, a single-sided test fixture versus a clamshell coming down from two sides, way more reliable, and the cost is the difference in the cost is significant. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, placement methods here, and I'm going to talk about the method. I'm going to talk about a method that I'm asking you to consider, and it might help you. Um, I essentially came up with some of this methodology because I did IC layout at one point in my life, and they build cells, okay, unions or groupings of functionality based from the schematic. That's why I'm showing the cross probe signals here, okay. So um, you're going to form these from the schematic based, you know, just and make general rooms, okay. You're going to create some functional circuit blocks. You're going to fine tune these circuit blocks for the surface mount pin escape you know, or surface routing, okay? And you're going to attempt to make these groupings somewhat square or rectangular in size, okay, as best you can. And you'll see why in a minute. And you're going to observe a consistent via grid allocation. So, and it'll give you the ability to do a modular placement of a functional circuit block for the overall circuit flow. So let me show you that. So. Before I do, before you attempt to do that, this is something I'm going to show you that one of the first steps you should do before we start doing these groups is do a feasibility study. Okay? You're given a mechanical constraint with fixed components or mounting holes, and you're shown how much usable placement area is on your board. Okay? And typically this sh should be done at the very start of it could even be done prior to the official CAD start just to see if it fits. So this was done in 15 minutes. That shows you how easy it is. Literally went to the schematic, assigned rooms, and then grouped them by their size. And you can see that essentially up in the blue area that I 
put all my active components and I just put them as close as I could, blue being on the top and the green areas the manufacturing keep out. And then I put all the discrete on the bottom kind of in red and I butted them up as close as they could physically go. And gee, a quick observance from the other side of the room, they don't fit. It's just easily, this is not feasible. Okay. I actually went back to the engineer on this board and I said, well, why are you doing that to me? And he goes, oh, I was just kind of curious to see if uh, they would fit. And I go, and when were you going to tell me about this? And he kind of goes, oh, I figured you'd tell me. And I'm like, well, good thing I did a feasibility study because, you know, no, <laughs> it's your quick answer. It's not feasible. And he goes, well, I expected that. I actually have double the circuitry in there. And he goes up to the circuit and he gets rid of half those BGAs. One of the memory banks went away. Half the test circuits went away. A couple of power supplies went away. And then half those discrete. And then, yes, the board easily I could see would fit. And so I actually dropped all those parts on, irrespective of their flow. Just put them on wholesale on the board. I sent it out to a fabricator. And I said, if I gave you this, could you assemble this? And this is on day two of the board. As soon as I got a placement, um, it's not an actual placement, it's just a preliminary one. A fabricator doesn't, or assembler doesn't care where U1 or U3 is. He doesn't care. He just wants to know what side of the board it's on. He can say, yes, that's a buildable board. Okay, and it's an early analysis. So, one of the strategies that's oftentimes I encounter is Many people, whether it's the architectural person or the engineer, would like to show a floor plan where they place the major devices first, okay? And all this is helpful to try to understand the intended flow. Um, it assumes that all the smaller passes will just fall in around the major devices. The problem is that one IC has got 300 discrete components maybe. And this could easily misrepresent the actual area required to place all the components that are relative to that circuit, okay? So this method typically, um, or approach, and moving all the components as individuals, it's gonna be more time consuming, more error prone, and it's not gonna help you if you have repeated circuits, because they probably won't be identical, and they would maybe not perform the same. So what I'm gonna show you here is a strategy, okay? It's just a strategy. Now, I could go onto this circuit and place, uh, what, what, what's, what's, what's the count of this? I think it's 2,629 um, individual components. A lot of mouse clicks there. And, or I could actually take the schematic and build them off the board and just open space and build them in a rectangle, as I said, grabbing all the components from the schematic in a room and build it up and making it a, a component grouping and giving it a functional name like Marvell CPU or DDR3 or you know something uh, ASIC or something FPGA or supply this or supply that but I did it on this particular one and I made 114 component groupings I could not place 2,600 boards in a week. It'd be a tough challenge, okay? But I could place 114 unions in one day. I've done it. I've actually done it on a long day, twice, <laughs> because they changed the mechanics around on me. But when it's modular and you can move them, playing the shell game, the unions, you'll see, and I turn off all the power and ground on routes, you'll just see the buses flowing. And essentially, you're picking it up. And when you pick it up, if you've given it some sort of intelligence to it, you know, you'll know that it's the Marvell CPU, not U15, because no one knows what U15 maybe is. So um, when I build that up, I build it up displaying via grid, because these are almost all surface mount components, and I want to see how they can pin escape. Okay, and I want it via grid, and that via grid is consistent with the BGA I'm placing. So if it's a one millimeter pitch BGA, my via grid is one millimeter, and so on. Major components, the origin, and careful consideration shown for that via grid. That's the primary key to this effort, okay? And then if you have identical groups, you have identical origins and grid placements, and then you can do identical routing and testability. I mean, essentially, isn't this what multi-channel is meant for you to do? Okay, I want them to perform and be characterized exactly the same, okay? 
Once I've got these groups, I can now do the floor planning that the engineer sees, except now it's more representative of the actual area required because it shows every related component. The unrouted connectivity, the rat's nest, is just, it's minimized because it, it, it reflects just the greater description of the bus and the circuit flow. It doesn't show all that short-term connectivity, which is misleading, okay? So typically, um, it's going to help for the logical understanding and provide a floor plan, which makes your placement modular. Here's an example of that, some of these placement groups where you can see I could literally should be able to take one of these and then place it on the next one, and I sh they should almost white out. They would be identical, unless there's a difference between the two circuits. Uh, same thing on the bottom. These two memory devices are identical to the other two that are over there. Okay. So again, this is what multi-channel is built for. It may take me an hour to craft up one, but multi-channel will solve the other ones just like that. And again, now it's modular. So now let's take our placement and take it into routing. Um, so we're doing pretty good on time. Um, we're going to try to look at, and I'm going to give you a couple, two overview slides here before we start breaking down and showing you some, um, uh, some aids and helps that we can do. From a routing perspective, rules, okay? Make them simple rules, make them effective on every net or bus you can. Whether or not you actually set a parameter, put all your buses into a class. Okay, this way I can highlight the class, whether I assign a parameter or not. I mean, I can sign length parameters, I can sign layer parameters, how many vias do I want on this bus? Those are things that might help the performance go well. Um, layer, which layers they're assigned to might help the solvability. Okay, um, I put, again, passives, aggressors, um, differential pairs. I put them into a general class because I want to highlight all differential pairs. And I'll show you where that um, is helpful later on. I want to make sure that no signal is writing next to a, a differential pair. I would call that trifferential, and that's not good. Um, the stack up. We already talked about materials matter, um, and they play an important part in the overall routing because, again, I'm managing a field. I'm not just making an interconnect between two points. I'm managing a field. So you've got to be thinking about that in routing. The placement, we've already talked about how these functional groupings, um, you can truly do that. And I'm going to show you that when we do the via fan out, we can still do placement after that. So let's keep that one uh, and come back to that concept. The via fan out, and so these are some of the routing phases, via fan out, which is um, basically making sure that the surface layers are complete, okay, so that everything else can be underground, layer two. Or coming up from the bottom, same thing. From power delivery, again, power delivery, you should always think of this as low inductance, high capacitance. That's what makes it effective. I want to make sure that when I'm doing routing, it's EMI compliant and I'm generating any signal integrity issues. So I want to make sure that it's correct by construction at the beginning. So now I'm free to truly route this, which is a big challenge, but I know that I'm correct by construction because my environment is good. Okay. And then we're going to cover into some of the general routing. Okay. But again, looking at routing from this holistic of approach of solvability, performance, and manufacturing, um, we're going to continue to keep that in mind. Um, so you can see what a dense board really is looking like here. Um, this is incredibly dense. There's no extra space. Um, I'm going to show you an Im image that I call no micron left behind, where basically every micron is utilized to solve this pin escape and its optimal usage. And then this image down here, I don't know if we can zoom in on that, um, but I really kind of like that. And um, nobody does inner layer fly-in like Altium does. I made these all gold just because it looked cool, okay? But you can color code them and display it however you want to, but it truly can show you what's going on underground and give you that 3D perspective. To me, it's one of the greatest usages when routing is your inner layer connectivity and what's the spatial relationship. So um, I like that. So thanks for showing that. This is a little bit of a review stack. I told you it would be two slides of this overview because there's phases to routing and then there are different types. So again, stack up, constraints, planning and feasibility um, during placement, and then solving the surface mount, the outer layers. Okay, I want a pin escape to a via. I want a short pin-to-pin -pin connection, no via. Um, I want to do any 
power source definition, which is kind of like right here, doing just the source of the power distribution. Okay, I want to bring testability into this equation. I need to solve testability during my placement. Okay, don't try to solve testability during routing. <laughs> You'll complete it during routing, but you're going to solve it in placement. Okay. Next thing is, once I've routed the outer layers, I still have some placement mobility because I can move uh, a component grouping with its outer layer routing and still move it as a module. You can't do that once you've connected underground. Um, so the power source, we're going to cover this. And there's a source, a distribution, and a usage. We'll cover all three of those. And then you're going to route critical. Um, things that are constraints driven, and then some of the bulk routing. And we're going to ask the question and answer the question, is routing, auto routing acceptable? I get asked this all the time. And I'm going to put to you that in an auto interactive way, absolutely. Why shouldn't I use the strength of my software? Why shouldn't I use the strength of my computer? Why shouldn't I shorten my design cycle? So those are three great reasons to consider it if I control it and make it perform exactly the way I want to and it's buildable. So um, routing cleanup. Now, essentially, we're going to look at that too. But essentially, don't design for the minimum. Design for the maximum and choke down where you have to so you minimize the amount of minimum criteria features. Design robustly whenever possible. Annular rings, trace, space. Design robustly. Increase clearances. Spread stuff out. Okay. And doing route reviews for solvability, performance, and manufacturability, and cleanups for all those um, perspectives. So let's get into this. When we start, first start fanning on our board, we may need to consider an HDI. Most people, again, think laser vias, but it could be many other things. But a fine pitch BGA of 0.65 or 0.5, you're using an HDI solution. You pretty much have to. Okay, just because of the fine uh, pitch. But this might also bring in you a manufacturing sequential lamination on multiple stacking layers. Okay, that image in your lower right there, um, over there, um, shows that end layer in the center, which is a through via, and then they've stacked four layers on both top and bottom at the same time. So you can see that that will go through five lamination cycles which is a significant amount of heat to subject your board to a thermal excursion. And we stated early on that heat is not your friend. So be aware that that's a concern. We want to make sure you don't stack vias on top of those. We'll cover that a little bit. Thin layers may be needed. OK. Typically, it's a one-to-one -one aspect ratio for a micro via and for a 50 ohm trace. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, typically about the same. Um, 3D routing. It's more challenging from a layout perspective. I mean, you're truly not just have a V and pick a layer to go 2D on. You're truly routing in maybe Z-axis type routing. It takes more time. Um, that's what that bottom bullet is indicating there. Um, HDI may give you improved signal and power integrity performance, too. So there could be a benefit of HDI. So this slide right here is showing a feasibility study that I oftentimes like to do I do it early. You can do this way early in uh, placement. And essentially what that's doing is saying, I've got this fine pitch BGA or whatever the BGA pitch is. How many layers do I need to pin escape this? That's what this is attempting to do. And you can see here that on layers two and three, these are ground and voltage layers by desire. And so if I'm pin escaping on it, maybe I'm threatening the integrity of my power and ground. So you need to be careful because you may solve one HDI pin escape problem, but you may be causing a signal performance issue on the other. So you need to be careful and minimize when you're utilizing your power and ground layers to do pin escapes. Um, but this is showing you a three stacked vias. And again, I never encourage you to stack vias um, on the through via, okay? Because of the coefficient of thermal expansion. Typically, they'll fill, copper fill the the micro vias, but they'll prefer to have a non-conductive fill on the big through via in the center. So again, placement feasibility, we've already talked about that. And maybe it's so dense that maybe you want to consider this via in pad. 
essentially I could have two parasitic entities. One is the land pattern, the other one is this via, and there's a stringer between the two of them. Well, if I slide that V and put it right underneath the pad, essentially now I have one entity. I've reduced my parasitics in half, and I've doubled my, routing, my surface routing area to pin escape. So the pin escape is right hidden in the pad. Now, they have to typically non-conductive fill that, okay, charting the z-axis expansion concern. And then they're going to plate the surface and then they're going to coplanar the finish so it's smooth for solderability. Okay? So you have to stipulate that in your notes when you do a VN and pad. But I love VN pad and it's very common to be used today. Most of your fabricators are like, yeah, I can do that, no problem. Minimal cost adder. And of course, cost adders are important in production. Not so much in prototypes, but uh, know what the end production is. Don't make a prototype decision that is not in line with your long term production uh, quantity needs. Okay. Okay, so typically we talked about that HDI will be required if you go 0.65 or below. And sometimes for high speed or RF performance, you don't want a long via sticking down. So I've seen that occur. Okay, sometimes the thin um, boards, um, living in San Diego, um, Qualcomm's here, and almost every telecommunication manufacturer. And OEM is here, it's called Telecom Valley, and they do a ton of cell phones, tablets, design, and stuff like that, where it's very thin dielectrics, and they're difficult to produce. And one of the HDI solutions is using a product that I've shown on the bottom there called the Ormet Sintered Paste. Okay, essentially, it's a conductive metal fill rather than plate the walls of this and subject it to multi lamination thermal cycles, you just paste fill it stack it all up together and under one lamination cycle um, these uh, metallized pastes form a z-axis connection and very reliable very robust um, but it's something you know reliability is something you always need to pursue down your supply chain um, so again some rationale for why we do it okay and is it more expensive when you do some of it yes but it's really required from performance, a tenth of parasitics a lot of times, okay, is lighter if you're doing a space application. Reliability, again, like I mentioned, is, is concern for a lot of people when it comes to this. Check on it. They do different types of, you know, uh, hats and reliability, ri reliability type testing whereby they're going to, you know, send it through multiple thermal cycles, 500 cycles or something like that to test the reliability. But you need to know that. And, the bottom bullet there is research all these requirements at the start, okay? Um, and of course, testability could really challenge your ability to, to establish nodal access. This slide right here um, comes by way of the, um, Tom Hauser and some of the development people at uh, uh, PCB libraries. Um, when I first started learning about the difference between metric versus inches, okay? Um, I could. I oftentimes ask this question, how many of you are designing with metric versus an inch base? And it kind of typically depends on where you were raised, what kind of schooling you had, and what your, your thought process is comfortable with, okay? But the Metrification Act said that we should all move towards doing metric, okay? That the inch base came out of England based on King George's rule of thumb. There's an inch. The foot is his shoe size. Uh, a yard is his stride. These are arbitrary things that are 12 base. They're, it, it, it's flawed. Why is it flawed? Because 99% of all parts that you're designing today, connectors maybe are an exception, some connectors, are metric. Not just in their size, but their feature size and the pitch by which they're separated pin to pin. And therefore, if you want, if you value accuracy, okay, notice what's blue on this slide, notice what's black. Look at this column over here. This is what the VIA data would look like. If you want to be accurate, this is what you're typing in to pin escape a one millimeter pitch BGA. You want to type in 0.5 or do you want to type this long number in? And you say, what well, I'll give it a round off. Well, round offs are fine if you're solving for one. But you've got a BGA that's 2,000 pins, which is a matrix, and do the math, is it 36, 50 columns and rows? And that 
delta of round off becomes a tolerance accumulation that will destroy the accuracy of your board. And it's so much easier to just use metric features on a metric board because every part is metric. So I encourage you to consider that. Um, so there's our no micron left behind image. And essentially we talked about the number of IOs on a signal BJ determines your layer count. Okay, we've already talked about this. And I'm using a via grid with a factor of a pin pitch that matches the BGA. Okay, and I, if I have to reset the origin to one of the pins, fine, so be it. But the goal is, is I want to um, count how many signal layers, and that tells me how many, uh, or excuse me, how many pins connected to signals right here in the blue, um, tells me how many uh, signal layers. And if I give it a ground plane, I know how many base layers I have. And I'm going to backfill a signal layer. I'm going to talk how we do that. But you leave, you wagon wheel fan out, leaving this power strip up the center of this BGA, as seen right here, in both horizontal and vertical. And you're bringing in your core powers and powers and grounds, and you're making a split plane, OK? And you're trying to get power in. I actually, in this image, has a couple of the vias um, right about here in that avenue. And what you're seeing is it would just destroy the robustness of that power rail. So don't do it. But when you do this at a one millimeter pitch, you're going to see the no micron image over here essentially shows you the exact one millimeter pitch with a 0.5 via a 0.25 drill, five spaces for trace and space. It's a perfect scenario. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take our unions and our groupings that we've built out there, and we're going to pin escape them. We're going to make any surface connectivity, as you see in this image right here. Okay, um, if it doesn't need to go to an inner layer, it's a surface only. If you have to do testability, you do it now. If you need to access an inner layer, make sure everything does so and do it on a one millimeter pitch BGA. And you'll see that rationale in a second. Okay, at this point, can I still move these? Sure, you're just moving the top layer and you can move it with its routing. Okay, so you still have a modular um, nature to this where although some routing is done, you can still place it, okay, or modify your placement. Um, so, and again, this is an ex excellent example of using multi-channels and not only reproduce the placement, reproduce the routing so that they're characterized and will perform identical, okay. So this image right here is, um, I love this image because it's showing what the outer layers would look like with every surface mount pin routed to a via. And every surface point-to-point -point connection made, okay? And um, what's the value of that is that, um, I, again, I still have a little bit of modular placement there, but then I lock everything down, okay? So you're seeing the unroutes there, and you're seeing all the outer, outer layers solved, and you can see that I'm able to add some copper pour on some of the power supplies. And if I wanted to, even for an etch balancing, I could add additional power rails out there or ground, whatever you choose. I'm assuming that layer two is a solid ground over all of this. So therefore, everything on layer one has a return path. Okay, So therefore, I might put a power rail on the outer layer. Okay, And again, this is a top and a bottom perspective. Everything you're seeing in red here is a bottom layer. But this is as viewed from the top, okay? so you understand that. Again, you're looking at that image. And so um, I'm actually about 12 feet away from this image on the screen there, um, if I'm looking forward anyway. You can see which pins are connected to ground. You can see which round circles are not. So the value of color coding your netlist, you can see what things are powers and grounds, knowing that those connections will be made in a plane. I do not need to show the unroutes because they're misleading. They'll be made on a plane. So therefore, I suppress the display of those. Therefore, it's showing me only the bus, which is really what I want to see to understand circuit flow. So I'm hoping you're seeing the value of this. Again, still modular at this point. So, I've routed the outer layers, and now I'm going to consider which layers should I start routing underground. Okay, And most people, when they look at this, they conclude, well, I'll use a top-down approach. And they think that's good, but it's actually, I put you, not the best. I, I'm using the word wrong. Maybe that's strong verbiage. But um, 
the problem is it will leave the most significant stub length. You can see it from the left two images on your right there, how much via stub if I come down and come out on layer three or whatever it is. I have that long stub and that's parasitic, okay? And you can see it, then I get it times two on the next image. However, if I was to start at the bottommost layer, internal layer, and route up, I'm utilizing the, the depth of both vias. Okay, it's my intention to truly pin escape both the start and the end and put no vias in the middle. I'm going to strongly advocate that and I'm going to show you this dense board is solved with just that. Okay, now if you have um, this, this last image right in here is showing that if you have um, a high speed signal that you don't want that and you don't want to use a HDI via, maybe you're going to back drill. Mm, I get that because you don't want the parasitic stub on it. But back drilling is a cost adder and it could be a reliability issue. Um, so i just throwing that out there. Um, okay, so digital signals are going to perform the best when they utilize the maximum depth of every via. Okay, so prior to routing the inner layers, the outer layers, I'm going to solve the outer layers, I'm going to bring all vias out, and then I'm going to lock them down. Okay because I don't want to bump into a via and have it move to solve one trace on one layer because on every other layer I've bumped that via over and I've cut off two routing channels from the next um, avenue. Okay, So I try to lock them down and stick to that. I'd rather jump over a via than change that via location. I'm going to lock it down as best I can. Now the inner layer is now a resource to solve all the remaining signals and power connections. You ensure that there's a ground return path adjacent to every signal, at least on one side, then you have an identical environment no matter which layer you're routing on. And they'll be correct by construction. Okay? So this, is, this image and this display of the next few images popping up here is going to show you that. <coughs> now as, as I click here, this is what the circuit looks like from an inner layer perspective. This is the exact same circuit you just looked at. The outer layers were routed, but now I've turned that display off. From an inner layer perspective, it's just the unroutes. You could highlight signals if you want to. You could highlight some buses. You see way over there, there's some color-coded buses. This is a great opportunity that if you're using perhaps 365 and you're doing a collaborative effort, what you're going to do is you've assigned some of these with layer constraints. You send it over to another part of your uh, team and say, on layer uh, 8 or whatever that layer would be, I want you to route this bus of signals, and you're showing them. Okay, so it's a great way to do collaboration because most of the intelligence was with the primary responsible uh, design engineer and the, the aid basically has to just do more of a labor intensive type routing. So I'm going to drop in from the unroute, I'm going to drop in some of these layers. And again, I got a via on both ends and then I'm just doing layers on, with no vias, just routing on each layer. So you can see a couple of big traces went in. And then each layer, I'm doing some, you can see some of the tuning that's gone involved there, okay? Um, most of the, in the center are differential LVDS type signals. But you can see as each layer drops in, it's kind of cool to watch them pop in. Um, I wish routing truly happened that easy, but um, it doesn't. Uh, but you can see those layers all drop in with that, okay? So whether it went on 4th Street or 5th Street, or which layer, if every layer was built the same, it wouldn't matter. Okay. So this is a great time to segue into whether or not any kind of auto routability is good. And when it's usually a trick question when I'm asked this, if they want to do some sort of routability or auto routing question, they're trying to say, "Do you like sloppy routing, Mike? Because that's what an auto router does." And they've probably never had any success with it, and they don't really know how to use it. Um, so I answer that question typically like this. As you can see from the past few slides, I'm going to handcraft those outer layers, ensuring that the short connectivity is exactly the way I want it for pin escape, solving surface to surface, and testability if required. And then I'm going to drop it to a via. And when I'm on an underground, why wouldn't I utilize some of the auto interactive capabilities? Now, you're going to take a look at version 20. I had the opportunity to preview this at Altium Live, and, which is a great event, so I'm going to make the plug for that. Um, I get to see some of these features coming out. You're going to like this because it's truly automation um, and they're truly trying to improve what is the auto interactive features. This is going to solve this with no vias on the layer I assigned it 
And it would take me approximately 45 minutes to an hour to solve this, what I'm showing you. <laughs> With 64-bit architecture and the enhancements to the software, this stuff is happening in seconds, under a minute, okay? And if you don't like it, you reverse it out, change a parameter, and throw it in again. No extra vias, performing exactly the way I want it. Why wouldn't I use that strength of the tool? Okay, so it's a combination of auto interactive utilization of auto routing. So um, you hopefully you have a new answer when someone asks you that. Now, will I go back over this and gloss, you know, and revisit these? Um, absolutely. Um, I can highlight them because I put them into buses. Okay, and again, there's incredible software features for the re-glossing um, of signals. That again, if you've not looked at 20 yet, you're, I'm trying to bait this because it is exciting, it's powerful, um, and it'll improve your uh, implementation of routing. So going into power delivery, I talked about the source. Essentially, I get it that applications shouldn't be trusted until proven accurate. But when it comes to power supplies, I like to see what they're recommending for the supply. They've got a lot of experience, and I can say, well, I did it the way they told me, so, and then I run it by my engineering team. But essentially, I oftentimes try to emulate it, okay, so I get the general understanding. So a couple of things that are going on with these sources, I've shown these. Essentially, green is ground. You see it out here on the outer layers flooding but also there's green in the center. I try not to let my power supply ground make contact with the outer planes. And the reason is if there's any unwanted switching going on, I don't want that to permeate out into my circuit. I want to send it all into the center of my IC. As you kind of look at a schematic uh, thing right here, that's what they do. They, the capacitive inductive loop on both the input and the output stream are filtering any of the noise back in through that. And then I distribute it. Okay, if you want to isolate it all the more, I en encourage you this lower image over here is you see the vias, the white dots in there. I'm adding a ground shield which acts as a 3D wall, okay, to prevent emissions traveling and radiating through the planes. That I maybe I'll encircle this whole um, power delivery source area if I want to isolate it, okay. So that's showing you, but notice that. If we're talking about current carrying capacity, a little further over here, and this right here is the power that's being generated, you'll see, I think, about eight vias right there. You want to know how much current carrying capacity your circuit requires, and then are you supplying it and taking it from the source to the distribution and then to the usage, okay? If it was a four amp uh, circuit, how much current do I need, or how many vias do I need to support that current? Typically a via, and you should know this kind of by rule of thumb, is that a via is somewhere between three quarters of an amp and one amp. So if I want four amps, I'm going to derate this requirement and typically double the amount of vias I need. Okay, um, that's a derating. And then once I do that, I'm going to take it into the distribution where maybe in the center I have a power and a ground layer to take it across the board and then with the same amount of vias bring up to its usage on the outer layers. And that's what this image shows. If I have BGAs on the top, okay, in this case I got them on both sides, but let's just assume they're just on the top. My power plane is better suited up here. That's why I told you to route at the bottom up with signals. Because you're going to backfill signal layers on the top with these power planes. And you've supplied an uninterrupted ground path for both of them, so it should perform good but you've brought, essentially, power delivery is, again, high capacitance is getting two planes close to each other, low inductance is getting them closer to its usage, okay? And that's where a lot of times a cap is just really charging the plane. And the plane, from a buried capacitance fashion, whether you're using um, a, a material like over there, DuPont's and Terra, um, and there are other ones that are out there, um, that's a, you're truly providing a buried capacitance. And the higher frequencies you start going, and the higher speeds, um, inductance actually plays more of an issue. Um, and so it should be of concern. But you're trying to bring that high capacitance to its usage. So that's essentially why I bring my powers as high up into the stack up as I can to minimize the inductance. Okay. Um, again, P 
PDN is an incredible, if you don't have this option on your Altium, I'd encourage you. First of all, it's affordable. I say it because I've bought it. <laughs> um, in the overall scheme of things, what I get from it, wow, it was great value to me. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to do the best product description of it for you, but what I'm going to tell you, you know, some, some voltage drops, some, you know, some current carrying capacity. Um, you want to see that, I mean, you think you have a ground plane, but in all actuality, what you have is Swiss cheese because you've drilled so many vias through it. Or maybe you've necked it down. See the red area right there? It's a, it's a fuse area. When you went layer to layer, you've made a fuse by not giving it enough vias. And you can see that down here that it's starved, okay? I'm pointing right there. <laughs> um, so I'm encouraging the, the use of that so you know that you've really brought good delivery, okay? Differential pair routing. Um, if you've ever attended, uh, I mentioned this earlier, Rick's uh, or even Lee Ritchie's uh, thing, the, the differential spacing is not that important. It's really more the length. But I'm going to tell you, you've got one of the most powerful CAD tools in the world. You can get this right. I just route them close together. They'll actually perform better because they came from the same place. Just bring them together and route them together and match their length. That's the simple answer of all that. Um, this, all this whole, you know, tuning and this, that, and the other thing, I don't buy it. I don't like it. I just couple them very close. And uh, this image right here, let me, let me, uh, I'll get to it. Let me, let me back up. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Hold on. I jumped ahead too many slides. When you're doing um, your differential routing, Again, thinking about my manufacturability, thinking about the performance, and even the solvability, routing pairs as pairs um, achieves all of that. And when I say as pairs, as opposed to right here, you can control basically what is the gradient and the amplitude. And I encourage you to spread it out more and keep it more lower profile. You get a higher density for solvability. Um, Performance-wise, it won't perform like a bandpass filter where this energy couples straight across here. Instead of going a, the whole length, it's going to couple straight across like a bandpass filter. So that's a poor design, OK? Uh, again, most of the energy is a single-ended um, signature like that image shows right there. The other thing to point out is that materials play a different um, or a role in this. And so I've showed some of the Isola's spread weave product family. And essentially, those are. Um, the ability to spread the weave out, okay? You can see it in this image right here where the weave has, the black areas is resin. Now, the dielectric constant of the weave is, is higher than the resin. The resin is very low, and therefore, you would have an inconsistent um, uh, impedance backdrop when you route a differential pair is in that top right image. Okay, you can see how one would be traveling over the weave and the other one over the checker pattern. Now you could try to do what's called as offset weaving or routing, which across there, which is is cute. I've done it, um, and it's kind of tough to do about a 13 degree angle. And um, good luck with it. I'm smiling, um, but if you don't want to use good materials, um, you might have some success with that. Um, but I would encourage you to consider, because they're making it affordable today, um, the spread weave. So these, again, are, are some of the materials in the different families um, which are geared towards those designs. And these images right here shows the resin stripped off um, so you can see what a trace would look like sitting over the fiber. So they're kind of cool images. Um, Chris Hunrath uh, brought these to me in, uh, at Inselectro. So they, they tell a pretty good tale of how the signal would perform more consistently over a spread weave. So I, I alluded to these earlier about when you're routing differentials and providing a identical environment for both members of this pair. So when a signal, assuming that on the layer opposite is a solid ground plane here, I'm good. But the other layer, the pink and the brown layer, is a reference layer to control my impedance. So as they traverse this area right here, this is a blip. The, the overall length of the signal, it's an inconsist it's a minuscule um, blip, but it's consistent to both members of the pair. Whereas opposed to this one example right here, 
okay? You'll see that one is writing the split along the split, and the other one's writing over the other net. And so therefore the impedance of the one here is going to be different. So I take a simple observation, I can see that. And actually one of the features coming out in Altium 20, which you're going to love, is you can actually ask it to verify its relationship to a split plane. So I encourage you to pursue that, but it's truly a great feature. Um, the other image here is about assigning rules. If I put all my differentials in a class and I can highlight them, I can see if another net came along and ran alongside of this, and that's our differential signal where I've got a pair and then a third one came right up to it, it would affect, it would be an event on one signal, not both. So um, avoid that. So essentially you're aiming for that square wave up there, but in reality you could get some overshoot or ringing, you know, and different things, and you want to avoid that. You want your differentials to be consistent and send them through the environment. Use the strength of the tool to achieve that. Otherwise you get a mismatch here between the skews as we showed earlier on the eye diagram. Use the strength of the tool to address your pad entry. You can do it with a snap of a fingers. It's that easy. Um, utilize it. Just bring them together and when you bring them together and you route them as a pair, you'll have identical lengths. And there's no reason you can't, shouldn't tune something um, with to within, you know, uh, microns. So uh, it can be done that easily. The concept of using arcs um, and for corners, you know, if, if, if I wanted to get um, theoretical here, you know, you can talk to a PhD on this and they might have an idea of whether or not the round is better than the angle, this, that, and the other thing. Um, at certain speeds, it will indeed probably be a factor that I just probably want to avoid. Not sure if it's a factor or not, but if I can accomplish it with the snap of a finger using a powerful tool, by God, do it. Just use rounded corners. When you get over two gig, just start using rounded corners on differential pairs. You can slide these two as a trombone. That's one of the new glossing features um, in 20 that you're going to really like is I can grab one trace and the two of them move together and they gloss. Okay, it's like a trombone feature. Okay. Um, when you start considering RF corners, I put that in the lower right of your thing there, um, there's a handful of different things that um, are better than others probably. And matter of fact, the best from an RF perspective oftentimes is that chamfered corner um, that you'll see down there. Um, but again, those are oftentimes modeled entities. You drop it in and just assign a net to it. Um, but that's in wide routing on an RF layer, typically. Not to be confused with these are di digital um, pairs here. On RF routing, I'm going to cover a little bit about this. Essentially, the RF engineer is trying to mitigate loss. They're trying to minimize any signal loss. They put them in chambers and they allow so much dB of gain or loss in that chamber. And then they transition to the next chamber. And each chamber has a certain amount of dB that they can lose, accelerate, or de decelerate. Okay? And typically it's a wider line because that's less lossy. And therefore you're going to weld down. Instead of having ground in layer two, you may add a keep out to that ground plane and then put another ground return underneath it. Okay? That's called welling down. And you might consider different low loss materials. Isola Astra is the same as that tachyon, which is a 100G material, but it has a very thin um, fiber in there for rigidity, but it's mostly resin. It's that rich resin, which gives you very low loss and very low dielectric constant, okay? But what you're oftentimes attempting to do is make a coplanar waveguide, whereby you can see from that energy field on that, uh, in the middle, the blue one, um, right here, um, right there, um, the, what that energy field might look like, okay? So it's primarily going down, but it's also going to go left and right, and that's the coplanar part of it where I'm putting ground. So in this image right over here, you see the green is a ground plane. In the black, I've highlighted um, my ground vias, so they're popping up as black, and I've essentially made a via fence around the trace uh, over the whole image here. Let me show you that. So you can see that my blue traces and the gray is down on layer three. I've welded down to layer three, okay? And I've given a via fence. So essentially I'm establishing a U-shaped coax around that trace as it sits in there, okay? 
The ideal thing would be to add some sort of shield on the top side, giving it four sides, okay? We truly can't reproduce a coax wire because they're round in a round chamber. We're doing a printed wire whereby get three sides and if you need to add a shield on the top um, to co totally coax it. This is our last slide here, just talking about printed elements in the RF world, okay? Anything, and these things, are printed elements that serve as a uh, functional part of the circuit. Okay, you see them over here. What I'm going to caution you on this slide is avoid exposing a printed RF element if Enig is the surface finish. Why? Because you're exposing the solder mask and you're covering it with, you see the gold, but what's underneath the gold? And that's a nickel. And the nickel will affect the magnetic signature. And how much is that affecting it? Go calculate that. Good luck with that. If I encourage you to use Smobic, solder mask over bare copper, can you calculate what solder mask is? It's got a dielectric constant of 3.3 and it's one mils thick. Boom, take it to any calculator and you're gonna be pretty spot on and you can deal with it, okay? Don't expose large amounts of traces thinking that you're somehow improving their signature, they're not. So with that, Essentially, that is our last slide. I want to thank you for following along. Um, really appreciated your participation in viewing this today. Um, hopefully, it's of value. I encourage you to share this um, with your coworkers. I encourage you to re-view uh, this. Take notes on your way. Um, share it with other people. Um, we have been gathering some questions um, from our audience as we're going, and at this point, um, we're going to take them over, but by way of recommendation, I'm encouraging you to subscribe to Altium's YouTube channel. Um, as Altium really seeks to bring you technical content to make you successful. They're not using this to sell software. They're using this to make you better and productive in your daily function. Share this with your friends and subscribe to that channel so you're alerted when uh, these type of uh, sessions are available to you. So again, thank you. and. Uh, looking to my moderator, Ben, what, what do we have for questions? Do we have anything? Thank you so much, Mike. Yes, uh, thanks to all of our audience as well from Colombia, from Slovenia, from Canada. Uh, and thanks for submitting all your questions. Um, the first question we want to address is from Ali. He's working on, on a board and has a question regarding that, I think. Um, he's saying, I'm following a 16 layer, 63 mils PCB stack up from Silinx for my current design with minor changes. Do you think 16 layer, 63 mils PCB is feasible to be produced? Dimensions are about 25 millimeters by 50 millimeters, 6 micro. Right, and so the XY dimensions are not of issue. Your, your issue is how many layers can I get into a you know, the, uh, the, the 1.6 or whatever your 1.5 millimeter board, 062 is a common industry standard. It typically is that thickness because it has edge fingers that fit, fit into a common connector. And the example I showed you on the board, when I laid those layers up, I got 18 in there once. So can it be done? Yes. Here's one of the things that I did on that 18 layer board to get me through that. Under normal circumstances, if you're using standard 0.1 trace widths, you need a 0.1 dielectric above and below the trace. And you just don't have the numbers in there, okay? So therefore, going to a thinner trace allows a thinner dielectric, okay? I use an asymmetrical dual strip line, which I spent a lot of time telling you I don't like, okay? So that was a concession I made. Um, but uh, can it be done? Absolutely. Um, perhaps considering a thinner dielectric using an ORMAT VIA might be an advanced solution for you. Um, again, it's robust, but that allows a thinner dielectric, which will allow a thinner trace, which again helps your overall solvability of using thinner traces. It will improve your routing density. So, yes, you've got a healthy challenge in front of you. 16 can indeed be done. Um, look at how you're doing it. Ensure the return path. Um, but it is indeed a challenge because normally that's a 12 layer board. Um, you don't see a lot of 14 layers because if I just can't add two layers, I typically am adding two layers plus two ground layers. So it goes from 12 layer to 16 layer, typically in, in, your, case, in your scenario. 
Um, we made it an 18 layer board because we added two buried capacitance layers and it was so thin that it didn't matter that I added those. So possibly considered a buried uh, capacitance layer like an Intera product that might help you. So uh, thank you for the question. All right, the, sec the next uh, question is by Sh uh, Chitranj um, asking, it was discussed that one nanom nanosecond rise time corresponds to 150 millimeters of length and 0 0.5 nanoseconds is three inch how well it's half of it basically it's it's half 0.5 is um is half and so that would be 75 millimeter length and that's just essentially what we um we're trying to give this a name and i've discussed this with rick a couple of times i call it a rise time distance it's probably a good name to use um so based on its rise time, we know that that is about the length you can consider throughout, and it should deliver the energy you want. But it's making the assumption that you had no impedance discontinuities or any events along the line or your material was working with you. You ensured a good return path. So um, if you need to go longer than that, there's a good chance it probably will perform. You, you got to see how many vias are on there because that might add to parasitics. So there's a lot of variables you'd have to go. But essentially, it's a, it's a linear equation that if one nanosecond is going to give you 150, that 0.5 is going to give you 75. Thank you. I hope this answers the question. Yeah. Um, so the next one is by Beros. Um, do you believe sensitive components must be placed away uh, from connectors? to be immune against uh, injected signals through harness. For example, in BCI test, uh, that is bulk current injection. Well, no, I follow your, your, your question and very good concern. I'm glad you're looking at that. Um, typically, if a high speed signal is coming on the board, you're best to put high speed components near it. But at the same time, if you've got you know static signals or regular I.O. signals, you want to make sure that you keep those worlds as best separate as you can. Now you're going to keep them separate by an X-Y or a Z-axis differential. So whatever you can to keep them separate is, is good. If you need to add a wall of vias between the two of them, uh, essentially that might provide some isolation. Um, but you really want to follow your signals out to make sure that they're not in the vicinity of any other signals whether they're a uh, would be a victim or an aggressor so you're doing good to observe that and um, you always have to look at the specifics so i can't give you a specific answer without looking at those specifics but your thought process is right to keep them separate all right thank you uh the next question is by thomas chester what is preferred and or more reliable back drilling a via or blind buried vias well, that's a great question, and I would think that, like so many things in the, in the PCB design layout world, that um, <clears throat> the answers are nuanced, meaning that what might be good for your world might not be good for someone else. It might be good in limited production. It might be bad in high production, okay? So I would need to add more qualifiers to really accurately answer that so that answer is of value to you. I would put to you that in high production, back drilling is a labor intensive and I have to pr treat the hole after the fact and therefore its reliability is subject to operator error. Um, I have a lot of concerns about doing that in production. Um, HDI vias, especially ORMED vias are highly reliable and depending on the volume of your production run, if you can afford the cost adder for an HDI type via, um, then that's a no-brainer. So you have to really look at the specifics based on a couple things, is performance, the manufacturability, the, the production count, and, and what's the volume too? If it's just one or two vias, fine, but if it's like half the board, if it's thousands of them, well then the amount of instances that that could affect um, are important. I also encourage you, if you're going to do back drills, is make sure you utilize rules so that you understand the keep out that you don't inadvertently come out on the layer that's going to be back drilled. You'll create a 
after fabrication short. Um, voice of experience in that one. Don't do it. Thanks. Good question. Thank you. So um, Thomas had another question. What are your thoughts on the following? Using high quality material and weaves or doing flyover cabling for high speed IO, PCI Express 4, 40G, Base T, etc. When you, if you're going into some of the high speed uh, protocols that you've named, um, if you're building your board and you truly want to build a million of them, consider doing some offset weave routing and go with cheaper material. If you're doing a lower volume of say maybe five, 10,000, something like that, and or reliability or performance are the major drivers, this is the nuance of saying, go with the spread weave material. Um, depending on the frequencies, you can't tolerate the type of performance issues, okay, um, that that would do. So my suggestion you would be is in prototype, spend the extra money, utilize the spread weave. If it works fine, you know, and you have the ability to, you know, if it works fine like that and you want to try to change the material, maybe you can and you would reroute those sections using that, but you'd have to allocate room to do so. If it's a very dense, you may not have room to do that, but um, I don't like gambling, okay? I really don't, not with my company's money and not with the performance. So if I truly know it's a high speed um, scenario, um, I want the performance and the reliability, I'm gonna go with technically appropriate materials. So I hopefully that, that answers that. Thank Good you, question. yes. Uh, the last question is by uh, Chitranch. Mm -hmm. um, per, he's saying, per Rick's class for high-speed signal recommendation, uh, for high-speed signal, recommendation is to keep same reference plane when changing layer. For example, one to three for signal with two for ground. This will leave the stub in PTH, how critical that parasitic inductance is with the current concept of using full via depth. Well, via depth. It's, a, it's a great question. So her, her question is, 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 is looking at several of these things as she considers high speed routing. Um, so um, when what one of the things that Rick tells you in his class, and I didn't cover here, I know he was covering it, is that when I transition from one layer to another and come out, hopefully I'm coming out against a, another ground plane, okay? When I'm going multiple layers down in a stack up, ideally is add a, a nearby ground via, which is a return path via, okay? This way that the field energy is still coupled between these two vias as they come down, and when they come out and they go out on the bottom layer, you've provided a return path through the via. If you come up, you're routing on layer one, two is a ground plane, and you come out and you go on three and you route on three, essentially you don't even need one because the return path will just follow you right around in the anti-path area, okay, and follow that around. Um, so I think that's asking your question. Actually, your question had another caveat to it. Um, trying to think if you can read the second part of her question again. Pardon me? It will leave the stub in PTH. Oh, the, the, the stub. So the stub. The, the stub is indeed there. And uh, if you're not using the depth and you're truly going down like one to three, like we talked about, and that stub is there, um, you need to ask yourself, um, and you can get some modeled parasitics of what a via would do. Um, you need to ask yourself that that's a problem. Um, and if it is, um, you need to really think it through. If um, RF people do not, you can't broadcast some RF signals straight through a board. Um, you can't do that and you shouldn't do that. Um, so that becomes an emissions issue and it very easily could be a parasitic issue that could cause any sort of reflection. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, again, um, please subscribe to our channel. We have a lot more coming. Uh, that might be of your interest and uh, share this video with anybody and make sure you tune in next week um, with Susie Webb. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate your attention today. Thank you. Thank you very much.